The Airbus A380 is a plane full of contradictions. Passengers love it, but airlines hate it. It's massive in size, but its order book is small. It's an engineering marvel, but it's already outdated. But amongst all of these contradictions, one stands out. The A380 was meant to tackle explosive demand for air travel, but a key design choice essentially guaranteed that it could never achieve that goal. So what exactly is the A380's fatal design decision, and why did Airbus make it? Let me explain. Before hopping into it today, happy Black Friday! Now, if you're not planning on getting your loved ones some Kobe Explains merch for the holidays, then I suggest you get them a gift from Novium, today's sponsor. Right now, Novium is having a limited time Black Friday sale, giving you 20% off their hover pens plus free shipping. What exactly is a hover pen? Well, it's a pen, it's a statement piece, and most importantly, it's a wonder of physics. The hover pen doesn't sit on your desk, it floats above it. Sitting at a 23.5 degree angle, a nod to the Earth's axial tilt, the pen remains suspended in mid-air, all without the need for electricity. Hover pens are designed to spark curiosity and creativity. Oh, and you can also get it embedded with an out-of-this-world feature. The hover pen Interstellar can be made in part from a real meteorite that formed over 4.5 billion years ago. Or if you want to go forward in time, instead of back to the past, check out the hover pen Future, which is both a fountain pen and a rollerball. Novium's hover pens will make for a truly unique gift this holiday season. And if you want to snag one yourself, be sure to use the code EXPLAINS at checkout to get that 20% discount and free shipping. Thanks to Novium for sponsoring today's video, and now, let's get back to it. Now, in order to understand the A380's fatal design flaw, we really need to understand how Airbus developed the platform in the first place. While just a single A380 variant exists today, Airbus initially planned to build a whole family of jets. First came the A380-800. Seating around 500 passengers, this is the A380 that we all know and love. But following its release, Airbus hoped to build two more variants. Next up would be the A380 Freighter, which would share the dimensions of the 800 but be optimized for cargo operations. And then, finally rounding out the family, would be the A380 Stretch, which, for the sake of this piece, we'll call the A380-900. Now, the A380 is already a beast, but this stretched version would have been an absolute behemoth. Its fuselage would have grown by an additional 6.5 meters, or roughly 21 feet. And remember, the A380 is a double-decker, so that means the plane would have added 21 feet of space per floor. The resulting jet would have carried 650 passengers in a three-class layout. Or if airlines wanted to get really crazy, they could have fit 900 in an all-economy setup. That's roughly twice the size of the A350-1000, Airbus's biggest commercial offering today. Now this might seem comically big and completely unnecessary for today's market, but we have to remember why Airbus built the A380 in the first place. Around the time of its launch, demand for air travel was growing at a breakneck pace, and Airbus believed that this demand would put significant strain on airport infrastructure. The A380 offered a remedy, since it could handle all that traffic without overcrowding runways or taxiways. Now, as we all know, this vision of the future didn't exactly come true. But hindsight is 2020. If Airbus's vision had played out and passengers completely overran airports, then stretching the A380 further would have made complete sense. Now, before we move on, we have to pause for a second and talk about how exactly Boeing and Airbus designed their aircraft. When building a new family, they'll often design around a single variant. In other words, they'll take the variant they believe is going to sell best and then optimize its proportions, like the size of its wing, gear, and tail, around it. They'll then copy these attributes over to the other members of the family. This is done in an effort to reduce cost and simplify the supply chain, but it does come with performance penalties. The 787 Dreamliner family is a prime example of this. 
Boeing always saw the 787-9, the middle child of the family, as the plane with the most sales potential. So the Dreamliner's wing is optimized around it. The result? Well, the 787-9 has been a smash hit. Meanwhile, the 787-8 and 10 adopted its wings, meaning they aren't as well optimized, and as a result, they haven't been as successful. If you'd like to do a deeper dive into this phenomenon, feel free to check out this video right here. Now, for the A380 program, Airbus took a similar approach. But curiously, they didn't make the A380-800 the focal point of its design. Even though it was the first variant to enter service, and shared its dimensions with the A380 freighter, it was overlooked. Instead, Airbus decided to give the platform an oversized wing that was better suited to fit an A380 stretch. This seems to imply that Airbus believed that an A380-900 would be the family's bestseller. But why exactly they thought this is a little bit of a mystery. After all, they never officially launched an A3D stretch, nor did it ever win an order. I mean, I guess there are some pros of putting oversized wing on the A380-800. For instance, they improve handling, provide more space for fuel, and deliver better lift at low speeds. But these benefits are almost entirely wiped out by the drawbacks. For one, these wings are just too heavy. As a whole, the A3D platform is overweight, and it really hurts the plane's efficiency. In addition, they were costly to produce, transport, and assemble. This made the A380 prohibitively expensive, as it boasted the highest price tag of any commercial jet. And then finally, there were structural issues. The rib feet, which connect the wing's skin to its internal structure, had difficulty handling the massive loads. These parts started to crack, which led to a lengthy and expensive repair campaign. But while these are all big problems, none of them are the biggest. No, the single most problematic thing with the A3D's wing is that it can't fit at most airports. Remember, the A3D was supposed to make it easier for airlines to operate within existing airport infrastructure. But this mammoth wing went totally against that principle. It was too big for most runways, taxiways, and most importantly, gates. With a near 80 meter wingspan, the A380 needs a Code F gate. It was the first plane to ever meet that standard, and only a handful of airports could actually handle it. This greatly restricted where the A380 could fly. So long story short, this design decision all but disallowed the A380 from living up to its potential. Rather than help airlines cope with the headache of growing demand, it became a headache in of itself. The question then becomes, what if Airbus had taken a different approach? What if its wings were smaller and optimized around the A380-800 instead? Well, it probably would have helped a bit. After all, the plane would have been lighter, cheaper, and more economical. But even so, the plane would have still likely underperformed. You see, these elusive Code F gates are reserved for aircraft that have wingspans between 65 and 80 meters long, and the A380's current wings are near the upper bound of that limit. It seems unlikely that Airbus could have shaved off a full 15 meters without making significant trade-offs. So even if the wings were smaller, the plane probably would have remained limited. And then there's the problem of demand. Like I alluded to earlier, Airbus's grand vision of the future never really played out. Sure, more people are flying today than ever before, but rather than growing at hubs, airlines have spread out, using smaller, more efficient twin jets to expand into more secondary cities. This has helped to better distribute passenger traffic and relieve congestion at major hubs, and this shift has ultimately caused demand for jumbos to peter out. Even jumbos that were better optimized than the A380 have struggled in this climate. Just look at the 747-8i. The Dash 8 is the A380's closest competitor, and it has a lot going for it. Tons of airlines already flew the 747, its engines were much more efficient than the A380's, and its wingspan was much better optimized. And yet, Boeing only sold about 40 of them. So if the A380's wing didn't kill the program, well, it seems that larger market trends probably woulda. All of this being said, the A380 program wasn't actually a complete failure. 
there are three major positives that Airbus took out of the program. First, the A380's fuel management system was incredibly complex, and much of the lessons learned from its creation were carried over to the A350, making its development quicker and simpler. Second, the infrastructure Airbus built to support A380 production has proven to be incredibly valuable. For instance, the A380 final assembly lines were recently converted to build the A320neo. These resources have helped Airbus quickly scale A320 production and address its lengthy backlog. And third, Airbus learned the value of building different wings for different planes. Unlike most modern commercial programs, the A350 family has different wings for its different variants. Sure, this adds a little bit of manufacturing complexity, but it also makes both the A350-900 and 1000 more optimized, and in turn, more appealing to customers. But at the end of the day, these are all kind of just silver linings. While these factors have helped to salvage the A380's legacy, there's no getting around the fact that the plane's been a massive disappointment. It's a really good thing that passengers love this jet, otherwise the A380 would undeniably go down as the worst decision that Airbus has ever made. So what do you guys think? Is there anything that Airbus could have done differently to make the A380 more successful? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. Oh, and if you like this topic and you want to watch a similar video on how the 787's wings killed the 787-10, then be sure to check out this video right here. Thank you so much to my patrons for helping to make this video possible. If you like what I do and want to help the channel grow, go ahead and check out this link right here. And as always, if you learned something new today, leave a like and subscribe to keep learning. And until I see you again, don't forget to look up.